I speak in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Some of the best advice I received growing up came from my mother. Whenever I came home upset from school, she always used to say that if you're able to find the humor in any given situation, you may also find the truth. As a pastor, I spend much of my time trying to understand what is really going on around me. I want to know how people live, what they like, what gives their life meaning. And I think that this is the case for all the priests here at St. James's. Yet oftentimes, we hide our true selves from one another. So it's hard to really know what's true and what isn't. So I found myself wondering, are the people exiting our church after the services truly happy, or are they putting on a strong face? Does everyone at church seem to have the perfect family, or do they struggle at times, like my wife and I, who are still quite new to marriage? Do the older members of our parish understand themselves to be the strongest foundation on which our community lies, or do they feel unnoticed and underappreciated by younger generations? At church, in the very place, it should be okay to let others know about how we feel, what our thoughts are, what our struggles may be. I often find that it can be one of the hardest avenues to really know the truth. So I'm glad to call myself somewhat of a comedic enthusiast. As an adult, I still avidly watch children's cartoons. I love stand-up comedy. I watch shows that push our social conventions. I even enjoy a bad pun, which are often the best kind, right? Humor is a wonderful thing. It disarms us. It causes us to smile. But more importantly, it often points to something that we know all too well, but otherwise fail to acknowledge it. So when looking at today's reading in the Gospel of Luke, I found myself asking, where is the truth in this passage? After some time, I remembered a funny little story that was shared while I was at Yale Divinity School, Berkeley Divinity School in New Haven, Connecticut. I believe it sheds some light on what we heard earlier in our gospel reading. A minister died and was waiting in line at the pearly gates. Ahead of him was a guy who was dressed in sunglasses, a loud shirt, leather jacket, and jeans. St. Peter addressed the guy, Who are you? So that I may know whether or not to admit you into the kingdom of heaven. The guy replied, I'm Joe Cohen, taxi driver of New York City. St. Peter consulted his list. He smiled and said to the cab driver, Take this silken robe and this golden staff and enter into the kingdom of heaven. The taxi driver went into heaven. And then it was the minister's turn. He stood upright and boomed out, I am Joseph Snow, pastor of St. Mary's Church for these last 43 years. St. Peter consulted his list and said to the minister, Take this cotton robe and this wooden staff and enter into the kingdom of heaven. Well, just a minute, said the minister. That man is a taxi cab driver and he gets a silken robe and a golden staff. How can this be? St. Peter sternly looked at the minister and said, Well, here we work by results. While you preached, people slept. But while he drove, people prayed. (laughs) That's such a bad joke. Thank you. Thank you for laughing. Still, it, it always causes me to smile because there's so much to it. At first, we laugh because we all know the stereotype. New York City taxi cab drivers are notorious for being a little crazy. But I ask myself, what about the minister and how he responds to St. Peter? As a shepherd of God's people, why was he not satisfied with the plain robe and staff that he was given? A simple leader needs nothing more than those adornments. He doesn't need finer adornments. And as a minister of 43 years, Why is he so up in arms that a taxi cab driver 
is finally getting a taste of the finer things in life. Didn't he know that the first shall be last and the last shall be first? They both got into heaven, so what's the big deal? Somewhere in this story, I think, lies the crux of the joke. It's really not about the taxi cab driver at all. We all know what the ideal minister should look like. But the caricature we see in this story seems all the more familiar. It is familiar because we may sometimes see these faults within our own ministers. We may see these faults with our fellow Christians. We may see these faults in ourselves. And acknowledging this, we find some truth. And the same approach applies to the Bible. As Christians, we believe that scripture has been passed down to us from generation to generation in order to help us know God's love and to find wisdom within it for our own lives. To do that, we are often called to put ourselves, or rather place ourselves, in the very stories that we hear and read. In our story today, we see the religious elites once again challenging Jesus. They view him as a blight to the social order. And they say that if Jesus is truly a religious sage, then he would know the kind of filth that surrounds him. And as usual, we see Jesus turning their argument over against itself. He counters by asking, if we are indeed godly leaders, then shouldn't we be with those who are in need of leadership, like a shepherd that seeks out sheep who've lost their pen? At first, we may feel that our place within this narrative is alongside Jesus. We are to walk alongside Christ like the shepherd seeking out lost sheep. We are not to be those overly pious Pharisees that want nothing to do with those in need of help. However, if we were to simply stop at this revelation, I would argue that we missed something from the larger narrative. And as such, we become the butt of our own joke. It is too easy to see ourselves in the right without pretense or shame. It is too easy to see another person's problems and not our own. And as a shepherd, to lost sheep rather than being the sheep itself, it's very easy to treat a person in need as other than or lesser than you. Sadly, when this happens, and it does happen, the church becomes nothing more than the caricatured religious institution that we see so prevalent in mainstream media. It becomes something rather than the spiritual compass that leads other people to an authentic relationship with God. So if the lesson we are to learn is not simply to see ourselves as Christ within this gospel, where is it that we find the truth? I find that we are not simply called to place ourselves in the role of Christ or the shepherd of the lost sheep. Rather, I believe that in any situation, we are first called to be our authentic selves, and only then can we place that person into the biblical narrative. The story then turns away from just Christ and the shepherd and it becomes something broader. It talks about the people of God. It talks about us as human beings. It talks about human nature. And putting that, putting ourselves into that story, we find that we are the Pharisee and the scribe. We are the shepherd seeking the lost sheep and we are also the lost seeking out a shepherd to help us in our times of loneliness, and in our times of suffering. We are everyone in this gospel because each role represents an authentic representation and a truthful aspect of our human nature, our thoughts and our practices and how we present ourselves to one another. And this is true in almost any church setting. At any one time, we may be the Pharisee. The ideal is we present ourselves as the pious priest or the perfect husband and wife the dutiful son or daughter, or the rich entrepreneur succeeding by his own brawn and merit. At the same time, we may feel like the lost sheep as we think about other aspects in our lives that aren't going the way that we intended, things that worry us or cause us to feel inadequate. We may have lost a job that we don't want others to know about. 
Maybe our family is fighting all the time. We try to match the things our friends have, but now we know that we're spreading ourselves too thin. We are worried maybe because we aren't being as charitable with our treasures as we feel and know that we should. Still, despite our inner struggles between how we present ourselves in public and how we feel about ourselves in private, God still calls us to be the shepherd. And as a church community, we must have courage to take on that charge. Yet I would argue that in order to do so with greater integrity, to build up the strength and health of our church body, we must also find the courage to share our true selves with each other. In order to build ourselves up, we are called to trust one another, not fear possible judgment. We are called to lean on each other, not put up a barrier of protection. Christ's most powerful and transformative work came to those individuals who intimately trusted him with their imperfections and their fears. So I charge you to start trusting your community of faith with that same level of intimacy. Whether we want to admit it or not, we all struggle with very similar problems. We are far from perfect. But God gives us strength to move forward. Yet if we are to truly be the church, a spiritual beacon for others and not simply an institution, then we must move forward with greater authenticity to ourselves and to each other. And we must do it together. Amen.